All right, everybody. Thank you for this, uh, for coming to this uh, special edition of the ATM MPO OCD seminar. And uh, our guest today is Tapio Schneider, and I already introduced him twice yesterday, so I'm not going to do it again. So, Tapio. <laughs> So I'm really having a wonderful time talking with, with all of you and just with the group of students just before. Um, so I want to talk in a bit more detail about what we're doing about climate modeling broadly, so the second half of the talk, and more specifically about um, how to parameterize clouds, turbulence, convection, and the like. So we were yesterday, I, I showed the slide and said you know, clouds are the, the primary source of uncertainty in climate projections because they're too small scale to be resolved in climate models. But of course, they're not the only source of uncertainty and they're not the only small scale proce processes. Process. Ocean turbulence, much the same issues, ocean, ocean middle scale eddies, um, cracks, openings in sea ice, the whole land biosphere. A lot of what we'll say later on applies to all of these processes, not just clouds. But let me just talk about clouds, turbulence, convection for a little bit first. And I got into this research maybe 2011, I think. Um, I, I was a user of climate models, and like many users of climate models, felt uh, it would be nice if they were better. And instead of just complaining about it, we should do something about it. And I wanted to dedicate at first, just a small part of my time, and by now pretty much all my time, um, to the problem of understanding and modeling the key uncertainties in, in climate models. And before I started out with that, I wanted to make sure that I'm not becoming redundant too soon, meaning that computers get fast so quickly that you don't really need a scientist to solve the problem. And I made myself these graphs, which later on published with a bunch of friends. What you're seeing here on the right axis is the so number number of floating points operations for the world's fastest computer since 1979. 1979 I picked because it was a publication of the Charney Report, so the beginning of climate assessment as we know them. And it's a log axis, so performance of the world's fastest computer has increased exponentially for decades. It doubles every about 1.2 years. Um, that graph already surprised me a little bit. I thought to the the, the growth in performance would have slowed down. It hasn't because of massive parallelism. Clock speeds have gotten, have not increased as rapidly anymore recently, but massive parallelism has allowed us um, to still build computers that stay on this exponential increase in performance. Now, why do we care? I wanted to know when you can resolve, for example, low clouds and climate models. So I took all climate models I could find in the public literature since 1979. That's the colored dots. And it starts with atmosphere only models, and atmosphere ocean general circulation models, and the environments or system models. And what's now plotted on the right axis, likewise on the log scale, is the horizontal resolution. Um, we started out, you know, it's this early days, Manavi models, close to a thousand kilometer resolution. Now, as standard, we have something like a hundred kilometer resolution with some atmosphere only models pushing towards tens of kilometers, 25 kilometers, and for short period simulations, we have to be higher resolution simulations now. And the right and the left axis are plotted in a certain way relative to another, and the way is that factor 10 here exactly corresponds to factor 10 to the 4 here. And the reason is that if you want to increase the resolution of a global model, of a 3D model, isotropically, by a factor of 10, you need 10 to the 4 times as many floating point operations, 10 to the 3 for three space directions, and another factor 10 for time. So if all increases in computer performance would have gone into resolution increases of an atmosphere model, the atmosphere models should have stayed more or less on the blue line, given that we have pretty much always had access to the fastest computers in the world. That isn't what happened. We've had a factor of 10 to the 8 increase in floating point operations since 1979. 
there's only a little more than a factor of 10 increase in, in horizontal resolution of atmosphere models, atmospheric components of climate models. The factor of 100 we could have gotten if we had stuck our computing power into resolution. We haven't done that. We have made models more complex, making an atmosphere ocean models and our system models, and we have learned a lot of things about the Earth system in the process. It was it was probably the right choice to make in order to invest in computing power. But now suppose complexity has reached its limit, for the sake of argument, and from here on you put all increases in computing power into atmospheric model resolution, then we should be following the blue dots wherever they go, and let's just assume that computer performance will continue to increase exponentially. Physical reasons why this is probably not the case, but let's assume it will be the case. So in a few years, we'll reach what, I don't know if you can see it, but this is supposed to be gray here, the gray zone for deep convection. So we reached resolution where you started resolving the convection to kilometers to kilometers. So um, get the resolution. We'll get there in a few years, and again, for sure, the time scales are already there. But now these low clouds that I talked about yesterday, um, starting cumulus are extreme. You need meter scale, maybe ten meter scale resolution. Cumulus not quite as extreme. You need hundred meter resolution. Um, so here's a kilometer. Ten meter doesn't even on the plot. 100 meters is even on the plot. So if you um, ask when will we have a computer fast enough to resolve low clouds, well, in time, who really knows? But if we stay on this exponential curve, then it wouldn't be before 2060. In terms of floating point operations, we need a computer 10 to 11 times faster than the fast as we currently have. And when I started thinking more seriously about climate modeling and trying to raise some funds to do it, I thought that the People at Facebook, I think, was the first meeting, and their question was, how much money do you need to solve this problem? And I said, well, I don't know what money, but I need a computer that's 10 to 11 times faster, and I think not even you can afford it. And, <laughs> and you can, I mean, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, bad news in the sense that computing is not gonna solve the problem, but the good news is we need all of you to solve the problem, I and mean, assuming ingenuity is, is, is the way forward, it's not just brute force computing. So that was just, um, as I said, I, I did this for myself to make sure I'm not going to be redundant too soon. And we are not, none of us are going to be redundant here very soon. And so, over, just thinking about climate modeling goes back a number of years, and conversations over a number of years with many people in the field. And we had a series of workshops at Caltech, four of them, in the last <coughs> 15 months and on the future of Earth system modeling. I think a few things have become clear of why innovation is perhaps not happening at the pace that it could in, in climate modeling. And I think a, a key, there's several key reasons. There's one, climate modeling happens at big centers who have done a good job with the resources they have, but they're typically under enormous operational pressures now that they weren't under a few decades ago. Seasonal forecasting, the next IPCC report dictates a pretty rapid cadence of model development and really it, it hinders innovation. Printizations are being tested with data, but if, for those of you who work at printizations, for example, low clouds, all of us use BOMEX, a field campaign 1969 in Barbados, summer in Barbados 1969. We all use it, we use it in my group, and we all get good fits to summer clouds in Barbados in 1969, which then we use in the Arctic. And that doesn't always work so well. Um, so we have, we have good data at selected times, selected locations, few of them. And we test on prioritizations there, but not really in globally representative ways. Um, a lot of resources have gone into model into comparisons. Again, that has been useful. It has, uh, it has getting it has made getting a PhD in the atmospheric sciences different in some ways, uh, perhaps not easy, I wouldn't say, but at least you now have a whole ensemble of models at your fingertips where you can compare models, and it has been useful so, for science. But what hasn't happened to the same degree is comparing models with data and using the data to make the models better. So that's. Uh, there's a large barrier between modeling and data acquisition, and that it would be good if that barrier gets smaller at least. 
if you talk with people on the data side, and have a phrase for it, our data dropped to the ground, they're not being used the way they could be used. Um, there are clear barriers there, it would be nice to break them down at least somewhat. Weather prediction has made a lot of progress through data simulation. As, uh, there's this nice review article by Peter Bauer in Nature entitled The Quiet Revolution. And it's really a revolution in accuracy of forecasts, but it's quiet because people perhaps don't appreciate it to the degree they could, outside of our field at least. And in large part that came through um, bringing progress in, in the flight math and, and uh, control theory and the like to bear on, on weather prediction and making data simulation work better. The same hasn't happened in time and modeling. So these are, I think, limitations of current practice and things that we thought could be improved. We can simulate these clouds in limited areas, and I talked about that yesterday. This is a uh, field campaign. Um, a few people here were involved in Rico. Um, the detail was involved with that. It's just a simulation of the conditions at the time. And again, these, these simulations are quite good in that we can compare them with the field data, and they are very successful. So what I want to talk with you about now is just one aspect of what we do. Um, I mentioned briefly yesterday, when we built a whole system that integrates observation with large eddy simulations, where large scale dynamics drive large eddy simulations, you learn from the observations and the like. But what I want to do now is just focus on one probably small aspect of how you can use large eddy simulations to inform characterizations in a global model. And this is just an illustration of how I think the whole rest of the system is supposed to be built out. So let me talk about this a little bit. And this is work that goes back um, a number of years by now. I started with George Teixeira, who was my, my guide to clouds early on. Started maybe around 2012 working on characterizations with a student then, Jamong Tan, who is now at um, Chicago. Then over time, a bunch of other people became involved and are still involved with this work. Lee and Kyle, Kyle, I mentioned yesterday, were doing LES, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and the year Anna and Ignacio are currently still working on those issues. And I'll, I'll talk about some work that there are all of these people have contributed. So if you look at any, any climate model right now, NCO or GFTL, or you name your favorite climate model, you find a bunch of quantization schemes in them. <coughs> All of them have the parameterization scheme for deep convection. And deep convection here means clouds that rain effectively. Uh, and they're typically mass flux schemes. The, the basic idea for those schemes go back to Arakawa and Schubert's pioneering work in the 70s. It really set the stage for what we are still doing in climate models. And all of these schemes also have shallow convection schemes. They often are also mass flux schemes slightly different in parameters. By now, there are some different shallow convection schemes around that are not mass flux schemes. Importantly, they're discontinuously different from deep, deep convection schemes, either in parameters or in structure of equations for both. And then there are boundary layer turbulence schemes, and they are usually diffusive schemes, so some conserved quantities that are being diffused. And these schemes are not designed together. They are not really working together. Um, often they work against each other. That's how, part of how I got interested in it was trying to use these kind of schemes in a more idealized setting to look at large scale dynamics. And, and if you do something like um, take the limit of latent heat of vaporization going to zero, you should get a dry atmosphere. There, there might be water vapor there, but there's no latent heat release. And all these schemes should reduce to wall bounded turbulence schemes. And they all have very different limits with canceling tendencies, in particular in the dry limit. And that already tells you there's something not physically consistent about them. They don't converge in resolution typically. So if resolution of the model goes to infinity, these schemes should converge to, well, to nothing or to a large eddy simulation, uh, subquid scale filter, and they don't typically do this either. Just taking limits alone tells you that that's maybe an okay engineering way of approaching the problem, but on some level unsatisfying. So what we started out doing with Jao was using <coughs> ideas that were pioneered by Pierre Shivesman and collaborators in the mid-90s. And in any any of these parameterization schemes, what we always do in the end is um, 
find expressions for fluxes like this, where W is vertical velocity, phi is some scalar velocity, could be temperature, potential temperature, or um, the moisture variable. And what Pierre pointed out is, well, you can decompose fluxes by doing a domain decomposition. In the simplest case, you say there are updrafts of an environment. The updrafts occupy an area fraction AU, and the environment um, occupies the area fraction 1 minus AU, the rest of it. And you can exactly decompose this flux into a flux, fluctuating flux with the updrafts, fluctuating flux in the environment, and an interaction term between updrafts and the environment. And then usually what's being done is that the updraft area fraction is taken to be small, so you're losing some terms. You're losing the first term, for example, to a need to be very small, close to zero. And um, you end up as an expression that looks like that. And boundary layer schemes usually focus on this first term and make this diffusive. Mass flux schemes the type that Arakawa pioneered, they focus on the second term. So convection schemes usually only take the second parameter as the second term, boundary layer scheme only the first term, and what the Keshiva's one pointed out is, well, just keep both. You don't need to choose one or another, you can always keep both. And what comes out of that is, is something called the eddy diffusion mass flux scheme, I'll say more in a, in a minute. That's just conceptual. You can do this for any number of subdomains. This is updraft and environment. You can do it for updraft, downdraft, for multiple updrafts and the like, and still go through the same, same motions. And you don't need to assume the area fraction is small. It's just a matter of convenience, but not something you really have to assume. So keeping both types of terms, the intuition is that here you have a turbulent flow. This is uh, Bomex, Verbatos, um, vertical velocity simulated in large eddy simulation. So red is up, blue is down, and green are clouds. It's just a slice from the large eddy simulation. And what you see is that there are often coherent updrafts that sometimes make clouds, like here. And then there is an environment that's more isotropically turbulent where they are embedded. There are also coherent downdrafts, say the updrafts can train, you can get downdrafts from evaporating precipitation around there. So the intuition here is that we model the updrafts as vertically coherent structures, and the downdrafts are more random, more isotropic turbulence, and we model them separately. And we'll extend that to not just updraft environment, but multiple updrafts, downdrafts, and so on. So this turbulent flux in this picture schematically then becomes, here's your environmental flux that's closed diffusively, so it's downgraded diffusion, but some diffusivity decay. And the second term becomes the mass flux term that involves the interaction between the updraft and the environment. And if the updraft area is small, then the environmental mean is approximately equal to the grid scale mean here indicated by the overbar. So the prioritization problem for the flux becomes a question of what is the diffusivity and what is this mass flux out front here. In the cartoon picture, again, we have these coherent updrafts modeled by the second term and more isotropic turbulence um, modeled by the first term. And then you have to come up with photos for K and for M. And for K, what we do is, well, this is what we do. Uh, and let's, let's bear, bear with me for a second. In the end, even if the details maybe are a bit much, I think the essence is not so clear to understand what's going on here. We are having equations for mean fields in each subdomain, updraft, environment, downdraft, and the like. And we have second order equations, equations for variances and covariances. So the mean equations are, for example, the continuity equation, which becomes an equation for the updraft area fraction AI here. There are terms on the right hand side that involve the interaction between different subdomains, updrafts, and environment, for example, and that's entrainment, detrainment. There are equations for each scalar mean, where the scalar could be an entropy variable, total water, another, or vertical velocity again, W again. And they have transport terms on the right hand side. And then they have these mass flux interaction term, entrainment, detrainment term, and sources like buoyancy, say, for vertical velocity, or microphysics for water variables, and the like. 
So this, this term here, um, we close diffusively again, and the diffusivity becomes a function of a turbulent kinetic energy, which is a special case of one of these covariance variance equations, and the mixing length. So we use second order equations to close some of these terms. So we use a turbulent kinetic energy equation to close a term for the diffusivity, and we have to say something about the mixing length and what we do there, I'll tell you in a minute. That's the basic structure of, of the scheme we're working with right now. It has a few things, a few things are very similar to what people do. They're entrainment, detrainment terms, mass flux diffusion terms, it's all pretty familiar. It's hundreds or thousands of papers written on it. A few things are, are structurally quite different from what's done typically. And maybe the most important piece is that you see all these equations have explicit time derivatives. Um, all schemes are currently in use, as far as I'm aware, except for a club, the yeah, basic scheme. You would make steady state assumptions on the subquid scale. So you assume that your subquid scale adjusts very rapidly to whatever a large scale does. And that's fine when your large scale is 1,000 kilometers. It's very fine when your large scale is 200 kilometers, even 100 kilometers. That's the resolution of the whole model. But it starts to be a problem, it's a serious problem, as you get to higher resolutions of climate models. And the literally the wake-up call for me, it, it was a wake-up on a May morning in 2014 in Switzerland. I, it was a Saturday morning, and I went to go hiking with my kids. I checked the Friday night forecast, and it was May in Switzerland. Kind of gray, but fine. And you know, The forecast was for something like 12 degrees centigrade, and we were ready to leave. And, I wake up and there's snow on the ground. And what can that be? This must be the wrongest 12 hour forecast I have seen 12 degrees off. And um, I started digging into that a bit. So Zurich is, in, is surrounded by mountains. And what happened is it was just pretty thin clouds that were reflected over the mountains that were snowing a bit. There wasn't much snow. You know. And Meteor Swiss is an incredibly innovative weather forecasting agency. We work very closely with the university. We have a good model, three kilometer resolution model there. And still they had completely missed clouds and snow in the morning. So what they had is they had a shallow convection scheme in their three, three kilometer model. Now they're one kilometer. And the shallow convection scheme was a standard climate model shallow convection scheme that adjusted atmospheric columns instantaneously to, to large scale environment. And at three kilometers resolution with time steps of a few seconds, what it means is you have supersonic adjustments of atmospheric columns. And, and it's, of course, physically a bit funny. Um, but what it means is they couldn't detect clouds over mountains because the clouds were regenerated at each time step in each, each grid box in you. And they couldn't get these clouds over the mountains that, in fact, came over the mountains in this morning. It's just one example of their these terms here, there's no subquid scale memory, in other words, and because there's no memory, you couldn't detect the clouds around. At, at higher resolutions, I think these time dependent terms will become crucial. They make your life a bit more difficult in, in that you know, your, your prioritization needs time stepping. You can take another point of view of prioritization. Everything on the left hand side here just becomes part of the dynamic core of the model rather than the prioritization that you saw for that along with other kinds of the core equations. Stuff on the right hand side, prioritization kind of shifts what you call a prioritization. That's perhaps a more useful way of looking at it. So that's the structure of the equations we're working with, and we have n updrafts, where n is a variable we can choose. So the environmental fluxes, as I mentioned, are closed diffusively. The diffusivity depends on the turbulent kinetic energy that we calculate explicitly and the mixing length, which I'll say something about. So what we wanted to do from the outset is build a scheme that's unified for all subgrid scale motions. So boundary layer turbulence, shallow convection, deep convection, we all wanted to re represent it in one scheme that we have consistent limits in physics and resolution and the like. And the scheme does it, and I'll show you some examples of where we are with it. The explicit time dependence in the memory, I think they're essential at short time steps and high resolution, and it's a, a feature that makes this computation more expensive than other schemes. You're closing second moment equations like turbulent kinetic energy consistently with the up and down drafts, meaning that the scheme conserves energy to the degree as conserved by the equations themselves. 
which I think is important for climate purposes, but likewise something that's hard to achieve with traditional um, perturbation schemes. And it has very little area fractions for these up and down drafts, and they don't need to be small necessarily. One way of looking at it is that it's a scheme that represents the density functions of conserved variables through a mixture of Gaussians, um, potentially plus then delta functions if, if the updrafts don't have variance themselves. By now our updrafts have variance, so it's, it's more like representing any distribution as a mixture of n Gaussians. Does it, for those who know about it, it's different from, say, what club does, where we don't have very good coherent structures. And then you need to couple this to, <coughs> to the clouds themselves. You need to say when there is liquid water, ice, and the like. And the way you can do it is by <coughs> using these PDF assumptions, carrying them through to the subgrid scale. So we, we couple this to the cloud scheme, the ideas of which go back to one while to Samir and Deirdrev, where you have some distribution, say, in you know, conserved variables, liquid water, potential temperature, total water. There's some Gaussian distribution in each subdomain. Here's some saturation line in solid, and everything above the saturation line is assumed to be saturated, and hence is liquidized. And if you know the variances, and the means for this distribution, we calculate explicitly. The covariances between these two variables we calculate explicitly. So we can just integrate out how much liquid ice and the like there is. It just becomes these uh, error function integrals that one has to do over each subdomain. It gives you the cloud fraction of the liquid water and the liquid ice. Um, at lower temperatures. So th then you get a scheme that makes at least consistent assumptions across all aspects of boundary layer turbulence, shallow deep convection, and the clouds and microphysics themselves. How well does it work? So here's uh, Bolmex that I was somewhat making fun of before, and that we all use it, and we all use it. So here is, here is just the sanity to check that we, that we can reproduce shallow convection in Barbados. Black lines are large eddy simulations, so that's the truth here. This is results from a few months ago, I know we've got slightly better results <coughs> since then. Blue is for the scheme that has explicitly time-dependent terms in it, orange for a scheme that is like that but doesn't have the time-dependent terms. It's liquid potential temperature, total specific humidity, the area fraction of updrafts, and the area, the updraft velocity. And you see the mean profiles are reasonably well reproduced. Some funny kinks at the top of the boundary layer that finally have removed, you know, whatever. The updraft area fraction varies with height. So it's one interesting aspect. And the it, it's not quite quite right in the perturbation, but it, it reproduces some of the same behavior as what you see in the Orgetti simulations. We are particularly happy with. So most other schemes assume a fixed area fraction. You know, we can reproduce the behavior of of the updraft area fraction with height reasonably accurately. So this is this is reasonably successful as far as quantizations are concerned. Um, we made this a little bit harder by still using the Bomex setup, but now we are making the surface fluxes in this situation time dependent with the periodicity of one hour. It's not meant to be physical, it's it's a bit of an artifice. I mean not sure what would give you one hour oscillations and latent heat fluxes and sensible heat fluxes. But it's a good test because it allows you to see um, how the convective life cycle works, how it evolves um, with changes in surface fluxes. So here's liquid water. This is a large eddy simulation. That's the ground truth here. This is liquid water in the, in the parentization. And it gets sort of the onset of the convection right. It has some problems with uh, you see it at, at the early onset here, it produces too much liquid water in that case. If you average the liquid water path with height here, so black is the large eddy simulation, the ground truth, blue is this prognostic EMS scheme. It has a little too low amplitude, there are phasing problems, but if you compare it with a prognostic scheme that doesn't have the separate scale memory, the phasing is completely off. So here are the surface fluxes, how they, how they oscillate, that's the forcing. And you see with this, without the subquid scale memory, you have the cloud peaks at the peak of the surface fluxes. In reality, they occur later, and this prognostic scheme, the prognostic scheme of the memory at least reproduces some of it, although I wouldn't claim that it's the best we can do. We're still working on this. This is just something we published a little bit ago. 
here's deep convection. Um, this is a uh, trim LBA in Amazon situation. The top is a large eddy simulation, it's just the updraft velocity in this case, and the bottom is the parentization what it does, and it gets to some things right. Height, height scale, velocity scale of deep convection is reasonably uh, simulated. The convection starts a bit too early, but not by much, just half an hour, an hour too early. And so for those of you who know, know about deep convection, it's a persistent problem that <clears throat> in the diurnal cycle of deep convection, um, the onset of parenthesis deep convection usually is much too early, three, four hours too early. So this does a little bit better than that. It gets a bit better diurnal cycle. I think it's still not quite there in, in being the best we can do. But again, I think it, the improvement here comes from A, having memory at the subgrid scale, and B, having the shallow and the deep convection interacting with each other in a, in a reasonable physical way. It's still very much ongoing work. This is a result here, yoga a few months ago. We're still working on those issues. Here's something else. This is a, a polar boundary layer. Gables is supposed to fit contained there. So it's a stable boundary layer, and that's a notoriously difficult situation for any prioritization for any climate model. Turbulence is intermittent and weak, and to get profiles of velocities, other concept variables, why it's hard. <coughs> so in black, our LES again. The shading is a range of LES results produced by, by other groups for the situation. That's a zonal and velocity. And dash is the parentization scheme, the single column model. Excuse me, copy it. So, um, you refer several times to the field experiments. Yeah. But what you're actually comparing to is LES. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is like an LES model with the environment of the yeah. field experiment. Uh, that's a good question. So, and it's an important question. This is. This is an LES trying to reproduce the conditions during the field study. <clears throat> the problem is that you need large-scale conditions to drive the LES, and we often don't have those very accurately where we have the field, field data. So people come up with this somewhat idealized setting that then they call Gables or Bomex, where, where these conditions are prescribed in a way that's inspired by the data, but not necessarily exactly the same. And the problem with that is, of course, that you then want to directly compare with the field data it's hard to separate errors or mismatches that come from the large scale conditions from those that come, say, from, from your large eddy simulation or your um, And I was wondering, when you see these plots and papers, the, the, the real data are usually not in there. And so a few times you track them down and plot them on it, and it doesn't fit all that well. The reason is that the large scale conditions may well be different. Mm -hmm. So the LES is our ground truth here for now. Right. It's inspired by field data. and. I have some plots with real field data, not for this, and I don't think in this slide deck, but can show you some others. Can you just say what it would be that would convince you that this LES is representing something like, like what's happening? A, a good field? match with the field data. I mean, that's the ground truth, right? And we have tried, we have okay. tried to get that. Not for Gables, we have not worked as much on. There were other field campaigns where we have um, gotten the field data and and try to get the large scale conditions as best as we could from reanalysis, for example, from nearby points, and then try to reproduce the field data for, for ISDAG. We have done that for DICOMS, um, stratocumulus simulation, we have done that. Um, it would be like your daily cycle of, of um, cloud it, properties? Or it's or usually like just you try to reproduce one flight. I mean, that's the hard okay. part, right? It's just one flight on an, air, on an aircraft. Okay. I usually don't, and, it's and not, you can't easily do statistics. Those. And it's kind of important to emphasize also that there is typically a big mismatch okay, between the scale of observations and the, what really the model is doing. And it's not necessarily a good idea to try to match one to each other yeah. because the, the performance of the model that we look at okay, from the, more the statistics point of view, you know, you isolate any point that you are going to measure. And you know, it's kind of very hard, okay, to prove that the truth is really the observation I mean, right. without having to say too many negative things about it. It's just yeah. one point, okay, yeah. into the cloud of the uh, of observations that you right. have. Yeah, no, it's a real yeah. challenge. And yeah. I, I appreciate why it's hard now and why you don't often see the data <laughs> points in these papers directly. So. And because we interrupted, I just want to make another comment, by the way, okay, because it's uh, uh, interesting, you know, what you find with the, 
the, the, the convection generation in the Amazon, we in fact found okay, that the most important parameter that affected the development of convection to the fact that it went later is the early morning fogs that you have in the Amazon that are not typically represented in any model but have a very significant mm. impact on the development of convection yeah. uh, during the day. So it's yeah. kind of an important parameter to... Uh, yeah, I can believe that. And so the key here is, is that I didn't emphasize the radiation is directly coupled to the parameterized dynamics, which mm -hmm. also isn't usually happening. And then if you have your fog coupling to array or any kind of mm -hmm. precursor situation, it's important that these things are consistently coupled. And we tried to do this here, and I think that's a good part of why it works better. If you're not done with it, I don't, I don't think that's a final word on it. But so the stable boundary layer, it's not very easily. If you look at time models, you find uh, temperature errors of something like 10 degrees centigrade over large areas and polar regions because they can't do stable boundary layers. So here, the parameterization is, is, is basically as good as the LES. And I don't think it was just luck, it was a good bit of hard work. And but what I liked about these results is that the hard work here was just going back to the equations of motion and what Ignacio Lopez Gomez who did this. We looked through all possible balances that you can get in our second order equations, toroid kinetic energy equation, variance equations, from which you can infer mixing length. We wrote down a whole zoo of these mixing lengths, and here are some of them. This is, uh, this is from, uh, from liquid potential temperature base, this is um, buoyancy production base, <coughs> this is shear production base mixing length. You get a, a pile of mixing length, this is just near the surface, uh, an overcup that scaling from Carmen constant kappa. You get a bunch of those, and then the, the argument we made as well, which one matters, probably the smallest is the one that's active. And so we combined them all with a smooth minimum function, and that's what gave us those results. And then you can go back and look which mixing length matters where. And you see here it's mostly shear production in the middle of the boundary layer, it's uh, buoyancy limited at the top, and it, it happens to work exceedingly well. And it's so it's based and pretty simple in the end. So, I think I said most of these things here. The scheme is it's prognostic. It can simulate the range of motion in principle, including FOC. Uh, we haven't looked at FOC, but it, it, in principle, can do that. Mm -hmm. um, from boundary layer all the way to deep convection. And it has relatively few tunable parameters relative to parameters in other schemes you find, because you have many schemes representing these processes, each with its own set of parameters. Here we have, there are Key things that are open here are entrainment and detrainment rates for these for these subdomains. That's sort of the key thing that remains to be those. And the way we have set it up, that scale adaptive, it can adapt to resolution. I I wouldn't want to claim at scale of air that it works for all resolutions, but we have tried to make it as scale adaptive as it can be, and we'll have to see how well it works at different resolutions. At least there is no obvious reason why it wouldn't work at high resolution. It re reduces to an LAS subgrid scale filter at very high resolutions. So what we're doing with it, and here's where this machine learning piece or data simulation piece comes up. For example, a key quantity that's unclosed is an entrainment rate, which you can write, I mean, with fluid dynamics, you just write it in terms of the non-dimensional groups you have. You can say it's a function g of a bunch of things that are non-dimensional, that we think that it should depend on, terminal kinetic energy and updraft velocity, buoyancy, updraft velocity. There in this case, there are five of those you can write down that seem to make sense that the trend might depend on. Now we can say is it's a function of these quantities, but we don't know what the function is. So now where machine learning ideas come in, and it's saying, well, we don't know what the function is, but we can try to estimate it from data. And we can do that, and that's what we're currently doing. The results I showed you just use the V over W squared only as one term, and they don't have the other terms. Um, let me skip this and move to now how this machine learning data simulation piece of it works. The important piece is here's a physical model within which all of that will be happening. I showed this slide yesterday, so we want a system that learns from LES, like the one I showed you, also from data. Um, how data, for example, in the specific case of these types of parameterizations, and how do you do this? So let me talk about that part a bit and the I think key to progress here was that uh, I met Andrew Stewart and I returned to Caltech. He started at the same time I, I restarted at Caltech. We started talking about these issues. He's an applied mathematician and um, we 
have been working together ever since, now with a number of students and postdocs jointly between us, and one of them is Emmett, and another is Alfredo, and I'll show you some of their results um, for how, how algorithmically you can learn from diverse data sources in physical, biological, chemical models. Tell me, or I'm say, go back to that. Um, are plaid shorts, plaid shirts mandatory in Caltech? <laughs> this is funny, right? I, I make the same joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are those all taken at Caltech? Or they? they were, and they were taken at the same day. It was in the kickoff meeting for climate modeling, and it was the funny part is, okay, I'll show you offline the picture of the whole. Right. Yeah. There were these people from the Naval Postgraduate School who also showed up in plaid shirts. I, I got my plaid shirt right here. <laughs> anyway, um, so the the key thing is this: we want to predict climate, and climate is is aggregate weather, right? So it's statistics, and the way we do it is the way a model, a climate model, I think, should learn from observations is learn from aggregate climate data. And aggregate climate data means you average over time. Uh, it might also average over space, but let's start with time averages. And how long a time average? Well, I think it should be more than 10 days, the time scale over which the atmosphere forgets its initial condition. So we don't need to deal with the better issues of, it, of simulating an initial condition. It probably should be less than a season because there's a lot of information and seasonal variability. So somewhere between 20 and 90 days is probably the right time scale over which you want to average. And then what you can do is you can minimize mismatches in statistics and mean values like the cloud cover um, statistic I showed yesterday between simulations and observations. You can minimize those by varying parameters in, in quantization schemes like the one I showed you, the treatment rates, mixing length, that's a lot. But you can do the same thing with higher order statistics. Um, Dave, someone asked about emergent constraints yesterday. So an emergent constraint would be, um, for example, there's the observation that the covariance between cloud cover and surface temperature in the present climate, so seasonal time scales or interannual time scales, in climate models correlates with the climate response of cloud cover to surface warming, which means that my concern is there's a fluctuation dissipation relation, which means that the <coughs> covariance between cloud cover and surface temperature in the present climate is similar to the covariance between cloud cover and surface temperature, or it correlates with that in, in a warming climate. And that's something you can directly use. You can minimize model data mismatches in, in covariance terms, like cloud cover as its T covariance is. That would mean directly using an emergent constraint to inform a model. You can do it with higher order statistics. Precipitation extremes can be informative about prioritizations and the like. There's really no restriction on the type of statistic you can use here. Anything that you find informative about for a climate model, you can stick in here. Um, you can do it for any any kind of subquid scale model. We're doing this for land modeling now, hydrology, and biology. There's a plethora of new information for biological data in particular. My colleague Christian Frankenberg is leading that. Chemical process models, you could do the same thing. And the first step in all of that is coming up with the right process models. And what that means is not always easy. I showed you some examples for these prioritizations we are using. It's a unified process model. What it means for, say, a land model is still something we are working on, how complicated or not the rock bank land model should be. One goal in all of this exercise of coming up with good process models is that you'd like to reduce the number of parameters and reduce the number of correlated parameters, which become hard to disentangle from data in the end. And then you can distinguish two kinds of parameters. There are things that you can compute and things you can't compute. <coughs> things you can compute in principle, things like entrainment rate, you can infer from computation and resolution simulations. Um, things like Microphysical parameters you can't similarly infer or not easily from high resolution simulations we can because we can't simulate the microphysics of clouds in sufficient scale or anything in a biosphere we can obviously simply compute. All of these parameters you can learn from observations, but only the things that you can compute you can learn from high resolution simulations. The key is to use both observations and high resolution simulations jointly and uh, high resolution Resolution simulations can only tell you something new about the computable parameters, not about the rest. In either case, you use a mismatch between statistics that you simulate by a global model and data, either observations or data from high resolution simulations, um, to inform, inform um, the model about parameters, parametric functions, and the like. So, 
bit more precise terms, you define some average, a time average, or some time scale t, which is somewhere between 20 and 90 days. And then you minimize an objective function that penalizes a mismatch between some function f of data that you simulate and the same function f of observations relevant from a high resolution model, all with a time average inside here. The function f has uh, the data itself, so the first term will be minimizing biases, the second term will be minimizing mismatches and covariances, and you can add other terms that, that uh, correspond to high order statistics, for example. The key is, and the key distinction from weather forecasting is the time average here. So you do all of this over time averages. The upside is, what's inside the norm here is relatively smooth because time averages are relatively smooth. Unlike the weather stage, where the cloud is here or there, it, it, it needs roughness. It's very different. To take the average cloud cover between here and there, it's mostly varying. So this function is smoother and easier to tackle if you if you average. The downside is it becomes expensive to evaluate because instead of just doing a 24-hour weather forecast to get whatever is in here, you need to do a seasonal run at least, perhaps multiple years of the climate model integration, and that's a lot more expensive. Um, there are a number of things you can you can stick into these functions. I mean, there's some examples of biases, and maybe let me be fast here since it's getting late. But these are Arctic temperatures colored from various um, climate models, black from observations. This is a bias. This is just the colors minus the observed observed figure. And you see most models have the cold bias in the Arctic that comes from problems with this stable boundary layer. Very large in some models. That leads to biases and sea ice cover it tends to be biased high because they tend to be too cold and the like. So this is one bias that you can that we know is there and you can mis minimize the mismatch between observations and models here by adjusting parameters in a model that uh, that, that affect or that affect that bias. Um, here's an example of a of an emergent constraint that I mentioned. So here is the the reflectance change per temperature change <coughs> under global warming by low clouds and 2095 models is numbered here. Um, and here is the reflectance change per degree warming for interannual variability in the same kind of models. It's not perfect, but there's a clear correlation between the two. So you can use the a covariance between um, reflectance change, albedo change, and temperature. And the warming, here's something you can observe. Here are the actual observations which you can use as an emergent constraint to try to say, well, these models here might be better than the models over there. They're not consistent with observations, and so they say, well, global warming might be closer to being right. That's one way this has been used. But now what you can do is you can just use this covariance directly as a term in the objective function, minimize the mismatch between observations and what the models do and hopefully get a model that, well, A, it simulates the present climate better, but there's good reason to believe it will also have better predictive capabilities. So. But in that case, sorry, would you be trying to get the model to look like the green line? Yeah. So you'd be wrong. I mean, well. Not the green line, like, sorry, this green line. These are the observations. Yeah. So they, this is just the one on line, one line saying that if the re relation under global warming would be the same as the as interannual variability, which okay. it's not. It's right. proportional. Okay. I should have taken this green line out. It's okay. just confusing for purposes okay. here. This green line here is what matters. Observations. So you would try to make a model that falls within the range of observations here. The future it hasn't been observed, so it can yeah. start. So. Same story for ecosystems. Let me just skip it. There are similar constraints between primary productivity and temperature, for example. So if you minimize an objective function like that, it's as I said, it's it's I think it's the opportunity for making models better. It's directly targeting what you want models to do well. It's a smooth function, which is nice, but it's computationally expensive, and that's a problem. Um, so let me just show you an example of, it's still a toy problem if you wish, but it's a GCM, an idealized GCM of the type I've used for, for, for many years for my group. It's an idealized GCM that has a Betts Miller type convection scheme that relaxes temperatures towards the reference profile. 
<coughs> in specific humidity is towards the reference profile, but never convection occurs. The reference profile is what's area about relaxation on some time scale tau, and the humidity is relaxed to the saturated, saturated moist area about with uh, some specified relative humidity in front of it. The scheme has two key parameters. There's a time scale and the humidity here. There's a bit more, but that, these are the most important. And just to prove the concept, how we can optimize a scheme like that, we took a GCM that had scheme in it, we generated data artificially, and then with a certain setting for these parameters, I was set to two hours, about humidity to 70%, and then we tried to re-estimate those parameters from the synthetic data we generated. So we created an objective function that had a number of things in there. It has a belt of humidity in there, so you minimize mismatches of belt of humidity in the tricosphere and mean precipitation rates, and then we included the uh, precipitation extremes, the probability of exceeding certain thresholds of, of precipitation. And the way we find we can solve these problems that are computationally complex is as follows. We use ensemble methods, variants of common inversion, for optimization, for estimating the parameters. <coughs> and here is an ensemble in this two-dimensional parameter space, and it's time scale, there's the delta humidity, there are 100 points, so 100, an ensemble of size 100 with different settings initially. And this converges within about five iterations at the cross, the <coughs> cross is the true parameter value. And if I let this run, it counts for five and here there, the whole ensemble collapses to almost a point. And that's a good news, it gets pretty much the right answer here. Um, and it does so quickly. So it's an ensemble of size 100, five iterations, it's 500 evaluations of this still relatively simple climate model. And we have given ourselves thousands, thousand evaluations are fine. That's typically what people do in, in climate centers when they hand tune their models. So running a model a thousand times is, is fine, this is 500 times. And it doesn't actually depend much on the number of parameters you fit. This number of function evaluations stays pretty much the same. So the algorithm optimizes well. The downside is this, this ensemble collapses to more or less a point. So you would like to use the ensemble to say something about uncertainties, and it's useless. You can prove in a linear case that it collapses exactly to a point. There is no uncertainty information in the ensemble. <laughs> and so here was the idea, and that's when Andrew and I were talking. I said, well, you know, it's 500 climate model runs. In the end, you use the mean of the last 100. But there were 400 before, and even the last 100, there's information there. Can be used it somehow. And so here's what we came up with. We use all 500 evaluations in this case to train an emulator of each term in this objective function. The objective function here, 100 terms, 96 to be precise. And <coughs> we trained an emulator, and the emulator is it's a Gaussian process. And in the true version, what it does is it's a regression in function space, where if, say, the red dotted function here, something you want to estimate, you don't know. You can evaluate it at a few points, the red points. And what a Gaussian process does is it gives a smooth fit to these red points that's exactly on the points so when you evaluate it, and that gives you an uncertainty measure between the points that's large, say, where you have no data, and that's small, where you have, where you have data. And it's just I think you need to know about Gaussian processes when, if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's, it's a non-parametric way of fitting functions that um, imposes a certain smoothness, and the smoothness itself is something you can estimate from the data. So the red dots are our climate model evaluations, or seasonal averages here. <clears throat> and we are just fitting these Gaussian process to the climate model evaluations as we get them during this ensemble common inversion. So we have like 500 points. And then we have a function that we can evaluate quickly. So the classical method for these inversion problems is, is Bayesian inversion with Markov chain Monte Carlo. And that can be done with a climate model because you need 100,000 to million evaluations typically. But now we can do a million evaluations on this cheap emulator. And the color line is what you get. So this is a posterior uncertainty in this two-dimensional parameter space again that we get from this Gaussian process that was trained on the ensemble. The black dots is the ensemble in the end, so this is what looked like a point before. It's not quite a point, but it's a bad estimate of uncertainty. <coughs> the colors are a good estimate of uncertainty, and I didn't know how to represent the truth on the same graph, but 
we have done an extensive calculation of what the true uncertainty is by brute force calculation for this model, and it looks very similar to the blue line. So we recover uncertainty, and the nice thing is it costs nothing, nothing that matters. The expensive piece is running the climate model, and trading the emulator is computationally cheap, evaluating the emulator a million times, it takes a minute on a laptop, it's, it's really easy. So we get, we get uncertainty information out of it, which to us is crucial. What we want in the end is better models that have quantified uncertainties. I said yesterday, we are, and we don't need to repeat it, so we're, we're building now a system that has all these pieces in the group work and what the atmosphere model and spin out LES, and the key is that these data simulation machine learning ideas that around all components simultaneously and in the end will inform all components simultaneously. And now we focus in my group on the atmospheric quantizations and use it individually, but integrate it in the whole model. We can do this for all the other pieces, land, ocean, and the like, simultaneously, which will um, help immediately rate the problems of compensating errors that we typically get. Um, Maybe I should say, so what I described was data simulation, if you wish, when machine learning comes in, the, this combining the, the Gaussian processes, it's an idea for machine learning, you can do neural networks instead of Gaussian processes, they scale better with number of parameters, something we have tried and we'll probably do more of. These are machine learning ideas, you combine them with the data simulation within process informed models, but to me it's uh, the way, to, way forward to get better predictive models. Things we want to be able to predict, um, hydrological impacts, or what everyone cares about, extreme precipitation, droughts, and the like. The impact weather, we'd like to be able to do better. The high latitude climate has large biases. Um, we'd like to know when you can ship across the Arctic with reasonable accuracy and quantified uncertainties. And these are all things that a few years down the line, I hope we can say a bit more about. And, and not only tell you this is a better prediction, but also tell you what the uncertainties are given the data. And then there's a separate question that came up yesterday, how do you convince people that's right, that that's in a way harder, I think you asked it, Brian, right? So at least we can quantify it and then to see how it holds up. So I think reducing uncertainties to me seems like, I mean, one of the most urgent problems in science, and, and time is running out here, it's uh, the nature is, is well, we're doing the unnatural experiment and we like to get ahead of it and saying what happens and with, with reasonable confidence and at least I want to try to do my part to, to do that better. Um, our view is that you need better process informed subgrid scale models. If you don't stick a neural network in there, I think this will not result in good predictive capabilities. It, it, it easily results in overfitting. You know, we have a system where you can guard against overfitting A by having process informed models, B by having um, high resolution simulations that help inform those models even as the climate changes in, in, in the simulations. The subgrid scale models can learn from observations, they can learn um, from high resolution simulations about computer aspects. These ensemble methods um, for optimization and machine learning methods for uncertainty quantification they seem promising. They, they work well uh, within the computational budget we have given ourselves, which is about a thousand runs of the climate model are okay. And with that, that seems su sufficient that we can uh, get good calibration and good uncertainty estimation. A lot of things need to be done and are ongoing and we are open to working with, with many more on it, developing subgrid scale models. What I showed you were smoothing approaches. We would like to convert them to filtering approaches. It's something that we're doing. We'd like to figure out where to best put your high resolution simulations so that they give you maximum information about the climate. Um, it's an experimental design problem that uh, we have a student and postdoc working on, and many other issues uh, as we go. So, and maybe I just leave it at that and I'm happy to answer more questions. All right, thanks. I'm going to ask for a question. Um, there seems to be a little bit of mismatch, so in the previous slide you mentioned extreme events, yeah. right? But your norm was uh, mean, right? No, 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 it's actually for, for, the, for the GCM it actually has extreme precipitation in the norm. Um, but that was, I mean, I saw the norm and it was average in a function of time. Well, that's a state factor, right? So, But even an even extreme is an average, right? So you just, <coughs> you're, you're, so what we concretely had in there is, is the probability of exceeding a high precipitation threshold that you can 
thing. And that probability is you get from 10 micrograms. Okay, we'll have to go back to that. I mean, because I, when you put up a norm, it was, you know, different to two things squared, right? And those were time average. Yes, but the things were were probability of exceeding of exceedance over a high threshold. The difference between what you simulate and what you observe. So that that minimizes the mismatch in extremes. So okay, so your so your norm is a set of chances of exceeding certain probability. That's one part of it. There were other terms of there. Maybe an easier way of thinking about it, you you put the 99th percentile of precipitation in between this this norm. Okay. The norm. But is that also be that being done at the same time as like mean temperatures? Yeah, yeah they all jointly minimize. Okay. All right, that's, that's a covariance cool matrix between them. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody else? No. Um, do you have ocean waves uh, in kind of context on the radar, and how high of a priority do you think they are for um, atmosphere ocean momentum exchange, mixed layer depth, and SSD, and options that get the Earth? Shallow and deep yeah, So the MIT group that Vera Ferrari is developing the ocean model, we have waves on the radar in the sense that we have talked a lot about how to have the free surface on the ocean. How important they are for mixed layer depths and, and the like, I don't know. Maybe my prior would be hopefully not terribly important, but I don't know. Um, and so Rob, John Marshall, and and, and their group, they're working on mixed layer perturbations intensely and using much the same concepts that are outlined for the atmosphere. Uh, now? Yeah, another question, it's probably more general. Um, you're trying to uh, you're trying to show the uh, LAS simulation versus your perturbation, but then trying to jump uh, put it into the climate model. And why jump the scale? Uh, for example, there's in between like LES and high resolution, there, there is a mesoscale model, for mm -hmm. example, where you would be able to um, find out whether it will work for the same for different uh, different um, uh, grid resolutions and make sure it's not damped when you increase the resolution. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can, when you would verify that it will work on different resolution from LES to uh, Subgrid scale in uh, climate models, then maybe it will be time to port it into more climate models. Climate yeah. models sometimes will try even to damp the atmospheric noise, which is considered yeah. as a, as a noise from the climate perspective. Yeah. So could you yeah, that's a good idea. You could do that. Um, so what we have done is is Im embed the prioritization in different type resolution. I mean, it's all the same LES code, but you can view it as a regional model if you go to kilometer resolution, perhaps. Um, you could just have a mesoscale model in between there. I think that's a fine way of doing it. The way I view it is that we're using the LES and, and everything I showed you there right now to develop a physical skeleton. And it's not important to me that it gives a perfect fit to any given LES that we happen to look at, which is still only a few dozen cases, really. It is important to me that it's physically reasonable and it's not wrong. It can capture more varied situations so that when we put it in a global model, that we can run at different resolutions, but then we can calibrate the, the tunable pieces, these very, very <coughs> parametric non parametric functions in, in appearing in it um, with a range of data and situations, including mesoscale situations and in various places. Um, so as to estimate you know, things like entrainment rates for multiple updrafts in a way that in the end they capture whatever happens at the mesoscale or smaller scales. You could do that by going explicitly to mesoscale models in between. That would be another fine way of doing it. Brian? Uh, beautiful idea of uh, parameter fitting through uh, lots of pouring, through, you know, use of data to fit um, unobservable parameters through their impacts or something. Uh, it's supposed to be happening at NWP operational centers a lot. Uh, is, is it, how do you compare or contrast your work with NWP type of centers? Is that that 10 day filter that you apply to your? Uh, yeah, I think that's a key difference, right? I mean, 
And do you think it'll be different or? I mean, two answers. I mean, what really happens, of course, in NWP is a focus on state estimation, and sometimes people then append parameters to the state vector okay. and yeah. try to optimize those, but it all, A, that isn't happening much. I mean, this is not happening routinely. The state estimation is routine. Okay. But B, it always happens over the short-term forecast window, 12, 24 hours or so. Right. And th there is evidence that climate errors manifest themselves quickly. Yeah. Even that you see, say, some biases that you see in the climate time scales already in 24-hour forecast that has given people hope that you could optimize over short windows and get a better climate prediction that way. And those who have tried, Jeff Anderson, for example, in his group, uh, have found that not to be true so far. You get better, mm. you get optimized forecasts, but you still have big problems on the climate scale. And, mm. you know, part of it is, I mean, again, I don't want, don't want to harp on a low cloud problem as the only thing that matters here. It's just a good illustration of some of the issues. Um, there are other problems that matter, but take that. It doesn't matter for weather prediction. If you get yeah. your stratocumulus wrong, who cares? You assimilate the temperatures you need there, they don't matter for anyone even, well, maybe in Santa Monica on a beach for a May, May Great Day. That's that's about the only situation where it matters a bit for weather forecasting. Because they reset the ocean every time they reinitialize. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's of no consequence for weather forecasts on land where right. people live. But it's of crucial consequence for climate. And I think you need to change your objective if you think about climate because okay. other things matter. Yeah. Uh, and what about, um, I mean, I, I understand the practicality of saying I'm going to take what data exists, um, but what about, is there any thinking in the future of how you might inform which data are collected and how? Yeah, 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 no, it's the point. I mean, that's, I talk with people at NASA, that was, but the selling point, once you have a system that can work this way around, has quantified uncertainties, so you get a, you get sensitivity map from parameters to data that you can invert, and then you can quantitatively ask the question, what are the next data that maximally reduce uncertainties further, and you would have a system that, that does it. If you wish, there are Aussies observing system simulation experiments, mandated by law now for NOAA. Um, <laughs> but, but still used only in limited ways and only in this weather forecasting context. I mean, basically, this would be a system with which you could do what Aussies are supposed to do for climate observations, quantify what their value would be in terms of reducing uncertainties. It's down the line, you know, we have to get the forward part done before we can do the inverse. But, uh, um, it's not the main focus point. Um, for non-computable um, parameters, aren't they represented in the models? And if so, for now. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are plenty of them, right? Yeah. So microphysical parameters, you can debate how non-computable they are. I mean, small scales, yeah. you can compute some of them, but they're clearly in there. But but anything in a biosphere, right? Yeah. Uh, residence time of carbon in various reservoirs, uh, all these things we can't compute, yeah. and, but we have information on from data. And so are those, what we do know, if it's just giving the standard values of things that was used currently, or is it not as part of for the like biological and um, ecological parameters um, that aren't computable, are those incorporated into the models right now or not? What's computable there? Is it incorporated? No, well, for those for like biological yeah. and um, ecological yeah, yeah. parameters that aren't computable, are they represented? Oh yes, oh yes. So there's, for example, NCAR's community land model. Yeah. It is more than a million lines of code. and. At the manual of it, I mean, there, it's hundreds of parameters that are just set in an ad hoc way. Yeah. I mean, it's based on guesses. Uh, yeah, kind of a response to your answer to Amy's question um, that one can use a, an OSI to, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, to try and assess kind of mismatches or preferred areas where you may need to make better use of observations. Another way could be using a sensitivity uh, type technique that, that cuts the full blown assimilation out with sort of different sets of observations, just produces a sensitivity map mm -hmm. to the observations just through a thing, an adjoint type technique. Yeah. I think NASA may have an adjoint that one could 
probably use for the fairly yeah. coarse version of the model. Yeah, that's an option. We um, made a conscious choice to use the rotor free work method for a variety of reasons. Computationally, that drones don't give you that much anymore compared with the rotor free method. It's still somewhat better, but the main reason is that. For the system model, the Atron is just really complicated and like to avoid it. And even if you generate it once, what it tends to lead to is <clears throat> a certain stasis in model development because people become shy to change the model because they also need to change the adjoint and we wanted to avoid that. All right, Sally, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> Run, and I don't think I'll see you again. <laughs> 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 <laughs>